Uh, I believe Cedric did it already. Please turn on your camera. Looks like. Yes, you are good. I don't care. Looks like it's time to go, right? So we are starting. Good luck. Hey, welcome everyone. Looks like we are all set and ready and live. If you can see us, if you can hear us, please press the thumbs up on the YouTube chat so we will know we can start. But on my side at least it looks all good. What do you think? Yeah. All right. All right. One thumbs up. Good. Good, 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 good. So let's roll, everyone. We have a lot of things to do today. And we don't have time to wait for too long. Wait for those who are late. Um, welcome to the, our very own DataStack Developer Summer Series series of free workshops two hours each plus some homework is going to be quite a contribution from your side but if you do that you will be uh, become a much better developer engineer maybe data architect or whatever your job in IT is understanding of NoSQL databases and how do you work with them in the right way is extremely valuable uh, there is echo 
Okay, that shouldn't be the thing. Uh, on my side, it looks good. How about how about from here? Uh, is it me who's giving the echo, or there is some echo in my audio? I really have no idea. Uh, okay. Ah, I think I have an idea. Just a second. I know how to fix it perfectly. No, what's an auto? How strong is that? Is it a high deal? Because um, I cannot find any echo on my side right now. Uh, so, I'm Alex, and is Echo on my side? That shouldn't be. Uh, Hi, this is Rags. Is the Echo on my side? Oh my god. It's only Alex. Okay. Uh, so, guys, I will ask you some questions. Uh, while we will uh, take care of the sound, I think I know what to do if you give me a moment. Um, and how about now? It should be better. One, two, three. One, two, three is the echo. Now it should be good. Okay. Same. Unbelievable. Okay, okay so, so you know what, guys? guys? You know what, guys? I will uh, start with that. Uh, a couple of questions. And meanwhile, I will take care of the... Um, I will try to take care of the sound. It all looks very good on my side. So I don't expect any echo, but we will see. Okay. So... Be back to one. Uh, I'm, I'm Alex, Alex uh, developer at Wikipedia Data, data Stacks, and, and I, will I will take care, care of this echo, echo while uh, Rex, Rex will speak for himself. himself. Rex, Rex, could you please introduce, introduce yourself? yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I I need to keep talking for about 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, uh, my name is Raghavan Srinivas. I go by Rags because. People, for whatever, um, um, you know, whatever reason, they have a tough time pronouncing my name, so I just go by rags, rags not to riches. Easiest way to remember me. Um, my undergrad was in mechanical engineering, and I like these workshops. I honestly really, really like these workshops because, number one, I learn something new even though I'm presenting. Uh, and, and I hope that's the experience with a lot of you as well because I know that many of you come back to the workshops and all that and i think you know there's a lot of interaction helping each other and so on uh and and one of the things i like most about these workshops is that you can see something move uh and as a mechanical engineer you know when it comes to software that's the closest you can see um i like to teach and communicate i teach uh, undergrad and grad courses in the boston area which is where i live um i also am a big 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 fan of the inner loop uh, um, you know, basically where you do this uh, edit, compile, profile, debug, you know, whatever cycle, like uh, 100 times during the day. Uh, and then eventually when you're satisfied, you push it to an outer loop, right? Uh, an outer loop is like more of the uh, Jenkins CICD, uh, you know, more robust uh, loop. The inner loop is a little bit more informal, uh, but I think there are plenty of productivity gains to be had, especially in the inner loop. Uh, with that said, uh, Alex, how does it look with respect to Echo? Alex, back to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rex, and I think we must be good by now. So, uh, there, there is a big group behind, behind this workshop, 
uh, and we will see uh, you will see many of them on the YouTube chat answering your questions. And now it's a workshop, not just a webinar. That means what you are pushing uh, buttons. Okay, guys, I will. Uh, I will uh, fix that during the next steps. I don't want to block you, okay? Uh, thank you for reporting it. I will see what I can do with it. Now it works. Oh my god. All the fun of kind of dealing with the new laptop, right? Yeah, I just got my new equipment and it's behaving, sorry. Okay. So let's move on. I will fix it in a moment. No, it should be single device. So, good, we have GitHub repository with all the workshop content. We have Gitpod, uh, and that is IDE in the cloud. You have Windowses, you have Linuxes, you have Macbooks, and very many different devices. Do not help you set it up at all. It will take few hours just standalone. We go with Gitpod. Gitpod is just like uh, VS Code, but in a browser, and works like a charm, so you don't have to install anything. And we will go for AstronDB. AstronDB is a Cassandra in the cloud. Uh, you will use it soon with Rex. Uh, yes, AstronDB is free, uh, has a very generous free tier, even for small production workloads. Um, now, if you do this job, you will get your page. And this page is uh, basically uh, to confirm your achievement, but more than that, you can get a free voucher for certification. Okay, guys, I see. I will see what I can do. It really looks good on my side. I don't understand what's going on. Uh, yeah, should be good. Okay. So, a few questions before we start. Please answer using menti.com and use the code you see on the screen. And you can get the code using menti command. Uh, so, you will see the code and the link in the browser. Uh, please answer using Menti. Right now, it's not so important, but in the end, uh, it will matter a lot uh, because uh, you can win a prize if you participate in our game. So please answer using Menti.com and code on the screen. Okay. A lot of people from India and some from the United States. Rural Alabama. That's nice too. <laughs> right. Okay, I tried something. Maybe uh, Echo will go. Maybe it won't. Tell me if it's got better. Okay, can't you? Okay, great. Okay, so let's move on. Now we are moving quickly and jump in because uh, you will need that uh, for the upcoming quiz with the prizes. So, what's your experience with relational databases? What the hell? And what about now? I changed something now. What now about Echo? Ah, oh, I have an idea. Hmm. 
This is with uh, SQL databases, right? You know, we are not talking about NoSQL yet. So, and that's the reason why we have the question on join. Yeah, good. Uh, what's, what's your experience, experience with, with NoSQL, NoSQL databases? databases? Oh, it's better now. That's good. That's, That's better, better now. now. Okay. okay, I think I know what was that. Yeah, and new laptop was a lot of pain. pain. Sorry, everyone, for experiencing that. But I hope now it is good. Good. And again, Very it, well. might be, it might be better to answer on Menti rather than on the chat. Um, especially once we get to the uh, the contest aspect of the presentation or workshop. Good. And uh, final question, what's, what's your, your favorite, favorite programming language? language? Just, you can submit up to three entries, but please speak just the only the very important language for you. Java, <laughs> Cedric is happy now. Okay, Python is grow, Python grows bigger, JavaScript. Okay, it's a huge competition between Java and Python. I see some C-sharp, okay, Ruby, good, Golang, oh my guys, my guys, good, no one for TypeScript, <laughs> would you vote for Java, basic ion, <laughs> good, okay, so looks like Python, uh, Java and JavaScript are leading here, I see some Jaka script. I guess it was JavaScript before. Uh, okay, so we are done with those questions. Please do not be painting. You will need Menti uh, in the last part of the workshop uh, to answer our questions. And maybe we have some prizes, but you know what? Please be very careful with that. Uh, you have to follow, you have to listen very well during the workshop and pay attention. And Menti code is right on the screen, uh, on top, or where, or where, I don't understand, there is an upper part, uh, but on top of the screen. And you can get it by typing exclamation mark Menti uh, in the YouTube chat. So, let's move on. Uh, there are a few questions we are going to uh, uh, cover today. Echo, I believe, is fixed. And... Uh, story is uh, simple. Why no SQL? Enter to Apache Cassandra some very important fundamentals for distributed architecture and how exactly do you work with, with Cassandra? Uh, first, why no SQL? Before speaking to uh, what is no SQL, we have to say a word about what the database is because no SQL database is still database or we better say database management system. Uh, we will speak about interface, execution, and storage. Not so much. Uh, interface is the most important thing for us because uh, this session is mostly for developers, and usually developers don't work too much with the database management storage or execution layer because it's more on the operation side if we want to improve something. Format, language, transport, everything about um, database uh, interfaces. So, for most of the uh, databases, uh, what I use it nowadays, it will be mostly probably uh, SQL, and most of you, as I've seen before, have experience with uh, SQL. Very well, it will help you a lot in today's workshop. Um, so, there are some people saying, like, stop SQL, drop SQL, it's uh, like NoSQL is everything. That is totally wrong. Each uh, tool, feeds its own goals and its own purposes. And relational databases are great. They're totally great as long as they fit into your case. They're very well. Uh, we have to understand, though, that there, there are uh, two different kind of cases uh, on the uh, line of uh, different database purposes. I mean, like, we have hundreds of different database engines and each one may be good in some particular case. What is the general distribution of those databases? Some of them tend to be more transaction processing, and some of them tend to be more analytical processing. And that is a very common misconception, what is what? Online transaction processing databases are usually customer-facing databases. They have to be ready to work with a lot of data, 
answer within many seconds, and that is very important. A lot of data, a lot of transactions, extremely quickly. So fast processing. You as a customer, do you really want to wait? No, as a customer, you don't want to wait. You are not happy if your application you are using is slow, you will just switch to a competitor. And uh, that's the story. Online transaction processing is for customer facing. It requires very quick answers. Uh, and there is a, a second side of this line, which is online analytical processing. Online analytical processing is different. Uh, online analytical processing is for understanding data, uh, for some complex queries, complex situations, where you need to understand your behavior, uh, your customer's behavior better. Uh, and you can wait, but your queries are very often extremely advanced. Uh, what are the customers who made uh, some, who bought something last summer from automotive section, but didn't bought anything uh, last winter of uh, some uh, different story? Um, those queries may be extremely big and complex, but usually you can wait. Uh, on this OLTP to allow uh, distribution of the database. Relational databases were in between. They weren't really fast in comparison with uh, databases dedicated for fast performance over big data. Okay, they were big, but only on small data sets. Um, and then they were, uh, they were able to execute some complex uh, queries, uh, but then not so fast. You can run a query of a 50 joints uh, with different aggregations, but you don't expect it to be quick, right? So we go for uh, all up as slow but complex and OLTP but very fast but ready to sacrifice something for that. So now why I'm talking about relational databases there? They dominated the market like 99% of the databases uh, for dozens of years were all relational. What happened then and why the uh, world now works and talks more and more about NoSQL databases? Story is the volume of data. Relational databases work very well as long as data fits in the single machine, in the single server. Then you have multiple, uh, when you have more data, you will need to go sharding. Sharding is painful, I did it, but you better not repeat. And uh, then you run into troubles, and sharding really destroys all the relational experiences with foreign keys and so on. Uh, new requirements has come of the volume, velocity, and variety. First, about the velocity. Beforehand, if you are like me from 80s, you remember the sound of a, a modem connection by USL Robotics, maybe uh, calling to an calling to a internet service provider by phone, and uh, top speed, top velocity was like 56 kilobytes, usually lesser, and you have to wait. So by those times, performance of your database wasn't really a big thing, because everything was slow. And you don't need a quick database. Is your bottleneck is your internet service provider. Right, Katie, you see, yeah? It was such a time. Now, everything works faster and faster. And my, my mobile phone is like a supercomputer of those times, like super top computer. And now we want things faster. Now we have new requirements by the velocity and the amount of a parallel usage as well. What we had, how many customers Facebook had at its start? Uh, I believe there were some hundreds and then thousands of people. Now we speak about hundreds, millions, billions. And that is a very different story. But also volume. Amount of digital data on the world. That is interesting. By now, estimate that there is a special report uh, ordered by Seagate. Maybe you know Seagate company. Uh, they ordered a huge research, but estimated amount of digital data uh, is around 80 zettabytes now. But by the time of 2025, it's going to be more, all getting close to 200 zettabytes. And zettabyte, people, it's a huge number. So, uh, like, it's really a lot. Of course, most of this volume belongs to uh, kittens, pictures, and movies, but still, of course, much more pressure now on the database. And finally, variety. Before, we stored everything or as a file 
or as an SQL row, right? Basically two options, file or SQL row, which stored in the file in the end, but still. That was pretty interesting thing. So volume changed drastically. Velocity changed drastically. The variety, uh, now we need to store more kinds of data. Sometimes it's similar, sometimes we don't know what we are going to store. Sometimes it's objects, sometimes we care more about the relations than even relational database can give us. But most of all, for us on this slide, relational databases have limited set of use cases and limited scalability. Uh, first name, NoSQL, was born in a meetup on June 11, 2009 in San Francisco. It's a well-known fact. And this story, uh, it's changed a lot, uh, mostly because of that giants of those times, like Google, like Facebook, needed more and more and more. Distributed by design, because there is no single server in the world what can get close to what Facebook needs or any big companies like Netflix or Apple need, you cannot have a server like that. You have to distribute your workload over multiple servers. But also, now we don't agree to wait and we hate downtimes. If you're, if you're trying to use an application and it's down, what you will do? Switch to a competitor, right? Uh, that means all data needs to be replicated. Also, more faster, distributed, and uh, higher availability. That's there a uh, NoSQL was born. And we use it to think. Now, if I ask you what is NoSQL, many of you will answer NoSQL is schemaless. That's because one of the most used NoSQL databases in the beginning was Mongo. If you are saying NoSQL is schemaless, please stop it right now. I like I'm very serious about that. Stop it right now. Uh, this is very serious. NoSQL can be document databases like Mongo uh, or some other DogDBs, but there are ledger databases, time series databases, tabular databases, graph databases, key value databases, and they have different interfaces and they have different approaches. Tabular databases require strict schema, and key value story will be very simple but very fast, and the and graph then cares about relation much more than relational database care about relation. So our idea is very, very, very important here. There is no NoSQL. You better think of that like of a different groups of different databases. And then you get to a real power of NoSQL. Into Apache Cassandra. Apache Cassandra is uh, in top three list of NoSQL databases. Apache Cassandra is used by biggest players in the world. Uh, Netflix, Apple, IBM, Activision, many others. Basically, if you take uh, Forbes list, the most of the companies will be using Cassandra because when you need uh, scale, you have to scale your data across the world, you need to have highest possible availability, and you have a lot of data, there is basically no other choice. There are some options uh, like proprietary databases like DynamoDB, for example, but if you go with them, you lock yourself in for a proprietary vendor, and you cannot easily migrate to any other place. If you prefer to stay unlocked with the open source, then Cassandra is really the only choice. So. Apache Cassandra is Netflix, uh, they have dozens, thousands of database servers running with Cassandra only, and the most active Cassandra cluster handles 30 million operations per second, and answer time is some within milliseconds, single digit milliseconds very often. And that is a very important because you need fast, a lot, and everywhere with data centers around the globe. Apple usage is even bigger, but Apple uh, doesn't really uh, open information about what's happening. What are the main features of Cassandra? What so big companies pick that? It's distributed, decentralized database management system. What are the primary features? It's ready for data of any size. Apple handles petabytes and petabytes and petabytes with Cassandra. And that's a lot, actually. Extreme read-write performance. Scalability, availability, cluster automation, 
because clusters can be very big and you want cluster to take care uh, of itself, not hiring hundreds of operations guys, right? Geographical distribution, when your customers are everywhere, you are limited to a performance of your database and if you run it only on, a, on one data center in Europe, when your Australian customers are not going to be happy, that's for sure. Well, then it's platform agnostic and vendor independent. Very important thing with big data ready. Cassandra partitions data over multiple servers. It means what each server is responsible for the range or data, not for the wall pieces of data. Because we have to be ready for data of every size and data of a big size does not fit in a single server, so we have to partition it. Read-write performance. Even a single Cassandra server is very performant, but cluster of multiple nodes are extreme level of a performance. They work together and each server is ready to handle each request. There is no like uh, primary server, follower server architecture like we used to use before. It's so-called masterless architecture where every server is able to handle every request is its write or read. And that is a very important. Linear scalability. Some databases can scale, but the more servers you add, uh, then less and less boost to a performance you get. And at some point, you run into a situation when you add more servers, but it doesn't really increase performance of the cluster. With Cassandra, it's not like that. On the right side, you see a great um, investigation done by uh, Netflix, Netflix people who scaled a test cluster from 50 servers to 300 servers, and notice how nice this uh, straight line is. By adding more servers, you are getting more and more clients' rights servered, but there is no downgrade that's a totally straight line. It's called a linear scalability. No overhead on new nodes added. It scales with your node. And by the way, do you see this a little star on scales with your needs? It comes with a price. You need to understand data modeling. We explain data modeling in details on the second workshop one week later, and you don't want to miss it. So book your time for the next week workshop right now. Then, highest availability. That's a very important feature. Yes, you don't want to be downtime. What Cassandra thinks, uh, how Cassandra handles that. First, your data is replicated. It means what the very same record will be stored in multiple servers on multiple data centers, if you have them, of course. There is no single point of failure because of a decentralized technology and uh, network topology where data placement. So your data, uh, different replicas of your data will not be stored on the same server or on the same server rack or on the same availability zone if you are using uh, availability zones on the cloud. So, and then very strong uh, reconnection and retry mechanism on the client side as well. So uh, most of the Cassandra drivers for different languages Programming languages were developed by DataStax. I'm proud to work with. And uh, there is a very strong uh, retry and smart reconnection mechanism what can connect you to the next node if this one is down automatically. Good. Self-healing and automation is a big thing. With a cluster, huge cluster of thousand servers, can you imagine amount of the people taking care of this cluster if anything goes wrong? Obviously, Cassandra designed it to be uh, to have self-healing and automated recovery when it's possible. In most of the cases, Cassandra cluster recovers its health status itself. As long as you have your servers running, of course, you still have to take care of the servers. If you're running Cassandra on your own uh, with DataStax Astra, we will take care of it. Geographical distribution, I told you already, it's trademarks of Cassandra as multi-data center deployment. For global companies, it's extremely important to have data, not only application servers, but database servers, also close to their clients, preferably as close to the last mile as possible, and that is very important. And now, magic, that if you are coming from relational world, like most of you, then, like everyone thinks, okay, I will have one master data center and two follower data centers. No, no. 
We have Cassandra. Every data center is an active data center, so you can write to each one of them, and data will be replicated to ours. Cassandra is platform agnostic, so you can run it everywhere. Uh, it's uh, open source application, what you can run on premises. And basically, you can build a single cluster running on multiple different clouds and on premises at the same time, and it will be a single cluster replicating your data. Uh, this way, you can afford losing a whole uh, cloud provider and still being up time. Like all AWS is down, but you are still running live. That's pretty cool. And finally, a uh, very important thing for me. Cassandra does not belong to any of the commercial vendors. It's not controlled by some uh, enterprises and commercial companies. It's controlled by Apache Software Foundation. Uh, and Apache Software Foundation, I believe, is one of the best and most known software foundations in the world working with open source. And you absolutely know Apache Software Foundation products already if you have heard of Maven, Hadoop, Zookeeper, Kafka, uh, Spark, and many, many, many hours. Maybe Airflow is getting very popular right now, and many hours where hundreds of projects what Apache Software Foundation governs. Of course, there is a lot of commercial companies behind Cassandra. Apple did a lot. Instagram did some great contributions to Apache Cassandra. Data stacks all the time. Uh, Netflix, and there are many other key companies, even Amazon, actually. Uh, but and still they don't own Cassandra. Cassandra is an open source project, truly, and it will stay like that. Cassandra is vendor independent. Okay, uh, so I uh, will give the mic uh, to Rex. Hey, Rex. Yeah. Good. Uh, it's your turn now because we are going to do a first step uh, with um, our practical part, I was talking all the time, now your turn to push for buttons. And I guess you will be sharing your screen? Yeah, I already started it. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Give me a moment. Oh, uh, should I maybe say a word first about what Astra is? Uh, maybe you should, yeah. yeah. Yep. And now, everyone, I see a lot of questions in the chat. I will answer them as soon as we complete um, the, uh, this uh, practical part, so very soon. So, two words about Astra. Uh, Astra is a software as a service platform running on top of uh, different cloud providers. It consists of Astra DB and Astra Streaming. I don't talk a lot about Astra Streaming today, it's out of scope, but Astra DB is basically Cassandra as a service. Uh, it's a totally great thing. It has a huge uh, free to use tier. Uh, it's about dozens, billions of millions of operations per month, and you still stay on a free tier, so very generous one, and no operations, it's taken care by us. Uh, so we go to that one, and uh, Rex, I'm switching us to your screen. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, you are live. Okay, great. Okay, great. So, so... <coughs> When, when, whenever I'm, whenever I'm working on workshop, workshop, sorry. sorry. Um, um. Basically, what basically I do what is I do is I have a repository and, uh, and uh, you know the, you know, the instructions, instructions are pretty self-explanatory. Self um, um, I'm having a, I'm having tough, a tough time today with my... <laughs> but in any case, uh, basically the instructions are very uh, clear and all that I do is follow along um, you know, with the instructions. So. So the first thing you probably want to do, if you don't know where the, where the GitHub repository is, is just put a um, exclamation GitHub, okay, or bang GitHub or whatever uh, on the chat, and it'll give you the. Uh, and I'm going to do it for everybody here. You know, just do a bang GitHub, okay, and start with that link. Okay, so that's the link I'm starting on uh, right now. Uh, basically, it's GitHub.com Data Stacks Devs Workshop Cassandra Fundamentals, right? And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to create an AstraDB instance. Uh, I think uh, Alex already talked about this. Basically, Astra is our uh, database as a service where I don't need to worry about uh, you know, I don't need to worry about the operations on their day-to-day -day operation, right? Um, as a developer, I just want it to be out there. I just want to use it, right? I don't want to worry about you know how data is uh, backed up, restored, uh, how data is repaired if required. 
uh, all that, uh, how it's distributed, nothing. You know, I don't really care, but I just want to use it. And that's really what AstroDB is. Uh, and that's what you're going to be using today, okay? So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to push this button, which is basically the create AstroDB, okay? So when you create AstroDB, okay, you're going to get, get to, I'm going to push it anyway, okay? And you should be able to, you know, get to something like this where you can sign up using either your GitHub link or your Google link or you can use your uh, email address or whatever, okay? Since I've already done this, right, I'm not gonna worry too much about this. I'm just gonna go right there, right? So I'm gonna go to, this is what we, what we call as the Astro Console, right? So we're gonna get to the Astro Console. So I'm gonna sign in. I'm gonna put in my email password and I'm gonna sign in. Okay, I have signed in for just a free tier. The free tier gives me twenty five uh, thousand per month, um, and and actually it's um, did I say it right? <laughs> Two point five k. Um, so basically, you can do some fairly significant um, workloads, you know, just with that. Okay. Um, so so all that I'm doing is like you know it, it talks about kind of no credit card required, forty million read write operations, eighty gigabytes of storage. Um, really sufficient to run small production workloads, right? Um, and if you want to put in your credit card, uh, then you can obviously get more. Uh, and also you can pick, um, you know, what uh, cloud provider you want. Right now, um, you know, Google is, is the one that's uh, uh, readily available, okay? All right. So for those of you who are going to, you know, start, who have never created a database uh, before, you're going to, Press this create serverless database. Okay. And basically, what this requires, you know, is the create serverless database, is you will require to provide a database name and a key space name. Okay, so so all of that again, you know, is explicitly stated, right? So make sure you use the same names. Uh, you can actually use other names as well if you want. Uh, but it just complicates things a little bit. You know, it's just easier just to go with these names. Uh, but if you really want, you know, if you really don't like it, you can you can always change that, okay? Um, so putting those, um, I, I've already done this, and some, some of you might have attended our previous workshops. So if you have already attended our previous workshops, all that you're going to do is, you know, you probably already have created a database called uh, Workshops. So, you know, I already have a database called workshops and I have a bunch of key spaces in there. All that I'm going to do is I'm going to add the key space, okay? And even this instruction is, is there, okay? So if you already have a database workshops, simply add a key space called sensor data, okay? And I'm going to create the sensor data. All right, let's go in and create that. Okay, so so I already have a um, a database called Workshops, and and one of the questions that we frequently get is, what the heck is key, key space? A key space is really <laughs> a logical grouping of your, you know, of your tables, if you will, or logical grouping of your data. Okay, and we'll see that in just just a moment. So it's really not a big deal. Okay. Um, so once you do this, your um, you know, your database is temporarily going to go into maintenance mode. Uh, don't worry about it, but it'll come back to active uh, the moment it's uh, created, right? So so here's my um, key space that got created, sensor data, okay? Uh, and we'll, we'll walk around that a little bit, okay? Um, so I, uh, what I would like to do at this point is even if your database is in pending state, just put in a thumbs up uh, in the chat so that we know that we are you are not running into uh, issues. Okay. So there is a uh, you know the process has changed a little bit, and you may have to um, you know copy a token and all that. But but you know let me know when you have started creating the database, and then we can proceed from there. Again, it'll take a couple of minutes. Um, all right, we already have a few thumbs up. 
Was I supposed to create the tables as well, uh, Alex? Or uh, as uh, as it explained it um, on the uh, as it explained it on this uh, instruction, we go with uh, step. I think we are good without creating tables. I think okay. we must be good. Uh, ah, uh, yeah, just create a new database or wake up an existing Hibernate database. We are good. All right. As long because as it runs. Yeah, and again, I'm... you know, uh, if if you're kind of uh, uh, out of sync with with the, the rest of the workshop, uh, you can always come back, get started on this. It doesn't take too long to catch up. So, and and you know, God forbid, you know, you still are not able to catch up. Uh, it's not a big deal. Again, uh, you can you can do it uh, at your own pace because the instructions are pretty self-evident. Okay. Uh, all right. So, Alex, back to you with the presentation. Good give me a moment. Yeah. Okay. If any of so, you are having trouble uh, creating, um, just let us know and we'll try to help you out. Okay. Right. Uh, and and oh, one thing I forgot to mention is the region, uh, which you probably already have done. Uh, just select Google Cloud and the area closest here. Okay. Yes. Uh, take a look. Uh, free tier is limited to Google Cloud. Yeah. And obviously. Uh, you can go with pay as you go uh, level, and there still will be twenty-five dollars uh, uh, every month uh, voucher. So you can go with not only GCP, but in general, I recommend in the beginning to stay safe, uh, stick to the uh, free tier, and uh, stick to Google Cloud. Yeah, Good. Twenty-five dollars. So. Uh, yes, uh, there is a way to get a security token. It's via organization. It's explained in our GitHub repo, but you know what? I want to, we lost some time due to this echo issue. So let's move on for the next slides. I want to stay on time. And let me switch back to my screen. Boom. Uh, good. And let me put you back. Right. Perfect. So, we are done with lab one, and we are moving to the next step. Next step is, okay, Cassandra is powerful. Cassandra can do a lot of things what our databases can't. But how exactly it works, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> how exactly it works. Let's take a look. There are some very interesting internals. You need to know. Ah, before that, I wanted to answer a couple of questions because I don't see them answered in the YouTube chat. Let me get quickly to eat. Uh, okay, good. Uh, uh, Marwan Abisi asks, does Cassandra use CRDTS for synchronized out of sync replicas? in the event of network partition. So, there are multiple mechanisms of protection. Uh, first of all, there are multiple mechanisms for recovery from the state when one of the nodes didn't get an update. Um, repair and read, um, regular repair, hint of handoff, and so on. And then for the second part, um, uh, for the, in the case of a network partition, first mechanism of protection in this case is consistency level I will explain it soon. So thank you for asking a good question. Uh, so G G yeah? does this uh, does the CRDTT is uh, is that the Kubernetes? Um, you know, I don't know what a CRDTS uh, yeah, clarify, I think, but I think, I think maybe it's a typo. <laughs> maybe it's a typo. I okay. think it's CRDs maybe um, you know, which is really what Kubernetes uses, right? But but let's not go there. Um, yeah, you can explain it, you know, without yep. it is anyway. So then Prasenjit Kumar asks, how much data can single node of Cassandra cluster can hold? So uh, I've seen uh, installations with up to 15 terabytes, but that is generally a very, very, very bad idea. It's not going to be fast. Uh, so usually we recommend to uh, have up to two terabytes per server uh, if you want it to be really performant. And we work currently on a big load project, uh, which is going to provide more. Uh, but frankly speaking, I don't know a current status of it. So usually we recommend to have around one to two terabytes. That's, so instead of yeah, instead of uh, larger disks and few of them, you would rather have uh, smaller disks and more of them, correct? Yes, uh, that is the story. I asked a uh, cloud database architect from Netflix 
Vinay Kumar Chalam. I asked him, like, how many Cassandra servers do you have running in production? And he told me, well, I don't know. The amount of the servers changed uh, because we have more um, flexible uh, infrastructure uh, to, I mean, like, tomorrow we will release last episode of last series of a Game of Thrones and everyone will be watching it, like everyone in the world. But the very next day, let's say, everything is quiet, people are visiting families, no one is watching movies, and they don't need so much servers to handle this peak load. And if you uh, have not huge servers with terabytes of data, but smaller servers with, let's say, uh, some half terabytes on them, then you can bring new servers to the cluster or vice versa scale down the cluster, removing servers from it uh, much faster. And that means what you save a lot of money keeping your infrastructure to, uh, to the current demand and you don't overpay on your don't stuck into the situation and demand is high, but you don't have enough servers. More uh, higher data density, more data per node, then longer it takes for a new node to start, just because it needs to get the partitions it's responsible for, and it takes times uh, more, ter the more terabytes per node you have, longer it takes. So some companies prefer to have intentionally lesser uh, data per node to stay flexible. That depends on your strategy. Uh, and one more, uh, how much time need for one repair on that big data in one DC? So, uh, first of all, Cassandra has, uh, Dmitry Yerushin asks, uh, Cassandra has a very strong mechanism on writing the data and retry it and hinting, hint at handoffs. So, repairs, especially big repairs, is not so it's not what happens every hour, right? Uh, if your network works, if your data, uh, if your data centers are operational, there are multiple mechanisms, that, uh, as uh, said before, to protect data from this kind of a situation. And uh, repair on a big set of data in case of a big outage may take a lot, of course, but you don't have to worry about that. Uh, because still there are so-called quorum mechanisms, so you will get your data. Repair does not mean downtime. Repair can take a while, a day, if you have a lot of data like full repair, which is not so often executed on the nor under normal circumstances. Uh, but um, the story, main story is uh, what uh, it's not so important because customers will not see it. Good. Are there any more questions you want to answer? Okay, I see... Ah, Artem Chibatko is already here. Okay, great. Uh, so... And cool. one more question from Vijay Kaushik, I think, uh, is relevant. How mm -hmm. many tables How many tables can a key space hold? Uh, do you want to take that, uh, Alex? Or uh, Really, it's just a logical grouping, right? So... How many tables a key space can hold? I remember a number of 100, but I don't remember if it was a recommendation uh, yeah. uh, or uh, if it was a recommendation or a hard limit. Oh yeah, uh, maximum recommended number of tables per key space is a few hundreds. Each table has an associated memory data structure. Okay. Yeah, you see, we have a master right here answering questions, so we can move on. Okay. So let's move. We have not so much time. All servers are created equal. What does that mean? Remember, like, how we use it to work with the databases. Leader server, master server, server like it's used to be known before, uh, follower servers. Uh, leader server is for writes and reads are for read only. What's the problem of this architecture? Okay, what is the benefit of this architecture first? It's simple. You have one master, you write to the server, and then it distributes data to all our servers, and you are good to go. It's simple to implement. That's why it happened to be the first one. But it also introduced some problems. If you uh, lost your master, uh, if you lost the leader server, you cannot write to the system anymore, and you will need to have uh, some uh, fallback schema, and uh, follower servers will have to elect and new leader server, and when you will be able to write new queries only then, and it takes time, uh, then new previous leader may recover to a situation when you have a new leader uh, what has been uh, re-elected and what has been elected, and that's quite a nasty story. 
and there are a lot of problems with that. So what does that, that mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think the golden rule in distributed systems is there shouldn't be a single point of failure. Right. If there is a single point of failure, it's going to happen. <laughs> it's sooner or later, you know, no, no matter how much you protect right. it. Right, right. It's uh, just so a question of time. Yeah. Correct. And uh, liberal follower architecture is like totally a story about a single point of failure. Second thing, leader follower architecture harder to scale for rights. With, um, with this case, you can spawn as many follower servers as you want, but you cannot simply go add a new uh, leader server. It will not work. It's not possible. And, uh, and therefore, you can scale for read very well, but you cannot scale so well for writes. That's, by the way, not only about relational databases. The very same architecture happens to be often in NoSQL databases as well. For example, Mongo scales good for reads, great database, but when you need to handle more writes, you are in much more troubles because of leader follower architecture. And finally, issue what heats up what heats application developers from time to time. Application needs to know where to write. If you have um, some bunch of uh, servers, application needs to know where to write because if you will try to write uh, some insert or update to a follower server, <laughs> it will not happen. Follower servers are read only. Cassandra follows different architecture. It's peer to peer, uh, masterless architecture, where each node in the decentralized architecture plays as. Um, makes the same role or all of them are masters or none of them are masters or whatever you how do you prefer to look at this situation but the general idea is uh, no single point of failure you can write to any of the nodes and data will be delivered uh, it scales well for both writes and reads if you need to handle more pressure you add more nodes and they will join the cluster and they will serve your queries and you are good and application can contact any node, so you don't have to think like which server I have to contact this time. It just doesn't really matter. Uh, usually Cassandra drivers know which node to contact, but uh, it's uh, uh, out of scope of a regular developer uh, things to take care of. Second thing, which brings a lot of power and a lot of problems. Data is replicated. So, what does that mean? It means what uh, the very same piece of data what you just inserted, information of one of your customers, will be stored not on a single server, but on the multiple servers. Uh, it's defined by replication factor. Replication factor means the number of nodes used to store each partition. I will explain partitions soon. Uh, then you create a key space, you define a key space name, and you define a replication strategy class, and you define replication factor per data center. For example, in this case, I'm going to use network topology strategy, and I'm going to have replication factor free for United States West Palm, and for whatever reason, replication factor five for Europe is two. But the recommended replication factor is free for most of the cases. I may have more data centers. For example, I have data center in Asia. But I think uh, for this data, for this sensor data I am working with, I just don't need to store in Asia. Then I don't define replication for the data center in Asia. And therefore, uh, this disk space is not consumed and only two data centers handle this data. Regarding the replication strategy, it's very simple to remember. Currently, there are only two. Simple strategy and network topology strategy. Simple, uh, simple strategy is good for your laptop and bad for everything else. A network topology strategy cares of a data placement away what replicas will be placed as far away from each other as possible. So, for example, if you use cloud, they will be placed in a different, in the same region, but in the different availability zones. So, if one AZ is down, your data is still available in the other AZs. Or if you move with your own data center, they put data to different server racks. So if you put data in the... Because if all three replicas are on the same server rack, and then power is down for this server rack, boom, all of your replicas are down, and you cannot access data. 
So network reputable energy strategy is your best friend if you don't want to have downtime. It's smart and it puts data far away from each other to uh, take care of the reliability. So, replication factor me one means what every partition is stored on a single node. Replication factor two obviously means what every partition is stored on two nodes. And as you can guess, replication factor three means what every partition is stored on three nodes. You may have more, but our recommendation in most of the cases is to stick to three. It's a better way and more reliable way. In some cases, you may want to have five, but it's a rare story. Now, finally, a uh, source of a lot of a confusion, uh, data is distributed. We all come uh, from relational database world. In uh, relational database world, all the whole table is stored on a um, server, like a uh, leader server in Postgres, leader server, let's say. And only if table is huge, like really huge, and single server cannot handle it anymore, you will go with sharding, and you will have multiple master servers for this uh, shard, uh, for this uh, table, and different parts of this table will be on the different uh, servers. And you run into huge, 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 huge troubles. Uh, sharding with relational databases is not native, and it is extremely painful. Oh, some flashbacks, like, <laughs> yeah, uh, you don't want to have sharding on your data. But still, Cassandra is big data ready. Cassandra is ready to handle data of each site. How does that work? The story is where data is a partition from the beginning. For example, here on the right side, we have the sensors by network the table. We will explain in more details uh, later. And uh, data will be spread over multiple servers. So it's still the same table, but different parts of this table will be stored on a different servers with some applications, of course. Now we see uh, what this has a partition key and primary key. In this case, partition key is what matters for us, because partition key defines partitioning, as you could guess. Quite, I'm quite obvious today, right? So, with a partition key, we see what the different sensors have different networks, and we see here, for example, sensors S001 and S002 above belong to a C network. That means what they will be stored together because they belong to a single partition. And each server responsible for a range of partitions. It's not one partition per server. It's multiple partitions per server. So data is organized as distributed tables. It's a, a lot of power in this and also some limitations coming because of that. How it works? Then you create a table. We will work a lot of with sensor data today. You, uh, if you are familiar with SQL, this statement should look very familiar to you. Create table, key space, table, then some value a type, then you type, oh, so, sorry, column type, column type, and finally primary key. In relational databases, we use sequential IDs. Uh, it doesn't work like that in distributed databases, I will explain soon. And uh, then we have to define uh, partition. It's defined by partition key. I want all my sensors to be grouped by network, as table name states. And then a sensor is a clustering column, I will explain soon. That's what brings me to this situation. As I define it, uh, network to be my partition key, my sensors will be grouped by network. How it works? Very interesting mechanism of partitioning in Cassandra. We need to distribute data evenly over multiple servers. If we cannot distribute it evenly, if like one server will be responsible for uh, biggest part of your data, and all the other will be responsible for the small part of your data. What happens then? We run into troubles. Because one server will be overloaded, others will be idling, and there will be no good answer for a customer waiting, of course. So, that's how it works. Then you designate a uh, um, network as a partition key, in this case. Forest, forest, cc, rot, rot. On the time you write the data, 
value of these uh, column or columns, because you can have multiple columns uh, as a part of a compound partition king. Uh, then a partitioner of Cassandra, it uses more and more free hashing algorithm. I like the name, like more and more, sounds like cat is working inside Cassandra. Uh, this uh, cat uh, hashing algorithm uh, will partition value of that, like for example, forest, in an integer. Forest becomes 59, C becomes 12, rod becomes 45. Uh, don't get me wrong, usually numbers are much bigger. Uh, that's just simplification for our tutorial today, but usually numbers are significantly bigger. And now, got the trick. Instead of the partition key value, we got token. And each of the Cassandra node in a data center is responsible for the range of tokens. It's called a token range, basically. So if we imagine what result of normal free hashing algorithm is always from 1 to 100, then that means what if we have a data center of four nodes, uh, First one of them will handle of the tokens ranges from 1 to 25, second 26 to 50, 51 to 75, and so on. And then you could guess what uh, forest equals 59 as a token goes to which node? Right to the third node. It will be stored by a third node. And C, token 12, will be handled by first node. And finally 45, rod will be handed by second node and fourth server stays uh, without any data but well there, that is a very small table right only six rows we are here why partitioning that's important to understand working with cassandra you will love partitioning and i promise you you will hate partitioning till the very depths like totally hate it uh, partitioning brings problems. When you distribute data over multiple servers, it brings a lot of problems. Uh, there will be no joints, there will be a lot of issues, get, like with search queries. Yeah, guys, that's not going to be easy. But, if you want to handle petabytes of data and still get your answer within some single digit milliseconds, you need partitioning and there is no other answer to this problem, basically. There's no opportunity for uh, for you uh, to have your data dispatched quickly for customer facing, as Cassandra is customer facing database OLTP. Uh, instead of splitting data into chunks and spreading them over multiple servers, there is just no other option. So now, good thing we are getting to scaling. Take a look. Each server is responsible for a token range. Each uh, row with a partition key token uh, from 1 to 25 will go to a first node, then 26 to 50 to a second node, and so on. And we have four nodes in the data center. Now imagine we have a lot of pressure, we have a lot of customers using our application. Uh, so we have to do that. And we have to do what scaling. We easily, we just uh, launch and there is a great question by Marwan Abbasi again. Man, thank you for your questions. Or uh, lady, sorry, I did kind of judge by the name. Um, that second good, great question in a row. I will uh, answer that second, in the second later. Cassandra scaling with partitioning is automated. We allow... Okay, uh, Marwan, thank you. <laughs> sorry. Um, how scaling works? I launch a new server. Uh, run Cassandra on it and tell to it, hey, where is your cluster? Go join it. And uh, Cassandra, a new node, notifies cluster, hello everyone, I am new here, what's going on, like, uh, what's my work to do? And then cluster calculates. Beforehand, we had this token range from 1 to 100, spread it over four servers. Now we have five. Yay, much better. And that means what each server, as a result, the token ranges will be recalculated, and each server is responsible for less uh, or less token range and therefore for lesser amount of partitions. And you see what happened? Now first server is responsible not 1 to 25, 
but only one defending. And for each server, we have less partitions to handle. And all the partitions, 81 to 100, will move to the fifth server, so each server will handle lesser amount of the partitions, and they are much more performant. And now, imagine our Black Friday is over, all the goods we were selling are bought out, and people now are counting their money, disappointed. Oh my god, I wasted so much money in this sale, I'm not going to buy anything next month. You know how it goes, right? Then, what do we want to do? We don't want to burn our money on infrastructure, on servers, when no one will use, and we have to go for scaling in. And we are removing amount of servers, vice versa. Moreover, we are going to go from five to three servers, and we go to cluster and say like, okay, cluster, we are not going to uh, have a lot of pressure next week, so please take down two nodes. And two nodes will be taken down and shut down, and uh, uh, token ranges recalculation, as you see, each node will be responsible for bigger token ranges, and therefore for bigger amount of partition. 133, 34 to 66, 67 to 100. Oh my god, there are lightning strikes right here. I hope we won't get outage. If you lost me, it means what my uh, ISP or whatever was hidden by lightning. <laughs> but okay, I'm still with you, looks like. So, we just went from 4 node uh, data center to 5 node and went to 3, and that is the magic. There is no downtime. All scaling calculations, operations are live. All this time data center is serving uh, operations, ser serving requests from customers and doing it very, very, very quickly. And you don't do work. You just tell, that is new server for VSDC. And now, okay, I want to take down those two guys. And Cassandra Cluster does that. You don't do anything. I am a very lazy engineer. If I can dodge any job, I will dodge this job. Uh, you know, my manager is looking this stream, so I better not say things like that. Uh, but that's exactly the situation. So, before that, I promised you to answer a question. Uh, Marwan Abisi asked, like, uh, how does that differ to uh, sharding? So, sharding and partitioning are two different approaches to handle the same problem. Uh, they both are developed to handle the situation when you have too much data what doesn't fit into a single server. But they work differently. Uh, what is sharding? You have small table on a server. This, you have more and more clients. This table grows, 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 grows. And you are like, okay, I, my server can't handle it anymore. I will go for what? Vertical scaling. Vertical scaling means you buy a bigger server and you migrate your data, usually with downtime, and you take down the previous server and your new server serves uh, further. Then again, this table grows, 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 and your this server cannot handle it anymore. And you do what? You go buy a bigger, even bigger server, migrate your data, usually with downtime, uh, discard previous server, and that situation may repeat a couple of more times. In the end, you find out what there is no server in the world what can what can handle such a pressure too much write operations and relational databases are great but not so performant as some no relational databases like Cassandra and then you are like okay there is no server what can handle such a table that means what I have to split this table into parts into chunks into shards and distribute it over multiple uh, servers. And there comes a big problem. Sharding means what you have to manually designate which parts of data will be served by each node. If you are going to scale with sharding, you are going to uh, again manually um, change the shards per node and migration will be the downtime. And it doesn't work like a charm. And uh, quite opposite. Partitioning is a native mechanism which starts to distribute your data from the very beginning. And you don't go with vertical scaling. You go with horizontal scaling. You need to handle more data, add one more server. You need to handle even more, add one more server. As a result, it's getting significantly cheaper on a big volumes. Because super servers are extremely expensive. Um, 
So with commodity servers like Cassandra prefers to work, that is a way better thing. Okay, so no downtime, all scaling operations are live, and I hope I answered the question, what is the difference between partitioning and sharding? And in uh, professional life on, of each of you, or most of you, I hope, because you are the best people, you come here to learn. And people who learn are the best, they usually get the better roles, better works, more work responsibility, more money. And that means what at some point working with a relational database, you may hit in the situation, okay, now we need sharding. And there is a trick. If you need sharding with your relational database, then mostly probably you better consider migration to no relational database like Cassandra. Let's move on. So, now bringing that together, we discussed partitioning, we discussed replication. Now we are bringing the things together. With replication factor one, each server will be responsible for its part of the overall token range. If overall token range is from 1 to 100, uh, then therefore each of four servers will be responsible for a quarter, 1 to 25, 26 to 50, and so on. But we bring replication to it. If, if we add replication factor 2, it means what each server will be responsible for two token ranges. And server 1 responsible 1 to 25, 26 to 50. Second server responsible 26 to 50, 51 to 75. So basically tanky taking responsibility for its neighbors too. And you can tell me like, wow, but that means what each server will have to handle more partitions. And as a result, the time of a disk space consumed will be significantly bigger. And I will answer, come on, people, disk space is cheap. But what is priceless? Your reputation is priceless. Replication means high availability. If you cannot afford downtime, if your business matters to you, you need to have replication on, or in this or another form. So, partitioning and replication with replication factor free. When we are going to write some data, for example, we are creating two new sensors for the forest network. And these uh, insert, because we write data with insert, like in SQL, gets to a server, which uh, first this server, it's uh, in this case um, uh, server number two, let's say, so this one is first, this one is second, so server number two gets this data. And first thing it does, it makes this conversion from a partition key value to a token. And we see what token is 59. Now, we see what this uh, second node is not responsible for a token range uh, of 59. But every Cassandra node is very smart. So Cassandra node knows which, or which servers, which nodes, are responsible for this token. And this, uh, this server will immediately dispatch this update to a proper servers, and servers responsible for a partition um, is um, usually called replica servers. Notice what for different queries, different servers will be replicas, because of a different partition, therefore different token range, Different token, different token range, boom, different server. So those three will be token uh, will be uh, in responsible for the token range of the partition number 59. And this update will be delivered. So that's how data is spread. But even better than this, I told you what this uh, second server, second node, nodes knows which servers are replica servers for this partition. It's called token aware mechanism. But for this story, actually, even drivers in Cassandra are token aware. So usually, situation like this will never happen, because your driver, Java driver, Python driver, JavaScript driver knows those servers are responsible for this token. So usually, this uh, query would arrive to uh, this server, or this server, or this server. 
But in this case, let's say we use it to retry mechanism which got hit to a wrong server. But again, it's not a big deal because each server in the cluster is able to handle this request. If it's a replica, it will get your data. If it's not the replica, it will distribute your query to a proper replicas. So it's totally automated. Like this database makes my life easier and I like it. So each Cassandra node and even each Cassandra driver knows data allocation in the driver. It's called a token aware. So your application can contact literally any server of a cluster and still get the answer or update information if you are writing something. Last thing, data is globally distributed. We discussed it already. Geographical distribution running multiple data centers in multiple regions. Works like a charm, totally great. And also, you can run different data centers on top of the different uh, cloud providers. It's quite advanced placement, so usually we don't recommend that. I mean, like, uh, it's much easier to set it up with a single cloud provider. But if you want to have 100% uptime, then you cannot go with single cloud provider. If you want to have 100% uptime, you have to go with multiple cloud providers. Um, now, uh, what is the biggest problem of replication? I believe uh, some of you understand already my hint. Uh, actually, I want you to answer. I am speaking all the time now. I want you to say a word or type a word. What is the biggest problem with replication? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I should have guessed who it will be. Hey, Rex, you shouldn't answer. Uh, uh, Nitesh uh, gives, uh, okay, so you guys are giving good answers, but right answer arrived at first. First of all, replication brings few problems. And I see you are, uh, you know what you do. Yes, bandwidth costs, financial or time. Storage, right, replication demire makes more uh, disk space consumption. Um, replication delay, yeah, replication delay, of course, present, especially if you write to a data center in Europe and then expect this data in Australia, there will be replication lag, no doubts. But um, the most, but the biggest problem of replication is totally mentioned again by Mauran ABC, give this, give this guy a medal. Uh, with inconsistency. Take a look. Uh, okay, so take a story. Uh, what's the story of this uh, inconsistency? Um, then you have to write the same new value, like previous price of an item was $12. Now it's getting more expensive and new price will be $13. If one of the servers was not able to get the update for whatever reason, uh, network outage, power outage, whatever outage, therefore we have a situation, then two servers have a new value and one server get an old value. And in any, that's not about Cassandra, that's about each and every distributed system, even without distributed system, when you introduce cache, that is already introduce a second storage for the value and you uh, have to keep very, very, very serious control on cache invalidation. And of course, that's uh, double as important for a distributed systems. Um, so Cassandra has a layered self-defense mechanism from inconsistency. Cassandra takes consistency very, very, very seriously. Um, first layer of this defense, call it hinted handoff. Then you write some data. Data is, will be processed by one of the servers at first. It may be replica, usually it is replica, it may be not replica, still fine. The, the server processing your current query is called query coordinator. It's not master, it's just a server what got uh, this message and going to do something with it. So each server is a query coordinator. Whoever processes your query right now is the query coordinator for this query. So we got this insert or update, and this query coordinator processes it. 
it calculates a token, uh, defines what uh, servers are responsible for that because it knows already and writes this data to those servers. And then boom, we have a problem. One server does not confirm what it's got the data. What happens then? Query coordinator stores a persistent hint uh, or hinted handoff. This hinted handoff will be stored on the disk and as soon as failed server recovers, uh, our query coordinator will see what it got back because of the gossiping mechanism and nodes talking to each other, what's going on in the cluster. Have you heard? Node number 5 is down again. Such a lazy server. I don't want to work with him. Like that. And then query coordinator with hints stored on disk sees what uh, server number 5 has recovered. It will dispatch uh, hinted handoffs uh, to the server, so it will be recovered automatically. Uh, and you don't have to do anything with that. Take a look, you can have a real outage with some servers down and wake up in the morning only to find out what your cluster recovered automatically. Isn't that a magic really? There is some magic in IT. That is magic in IT. And data will be delivered and we are good. But that is just the first layer of the defense. Actually, there are more. I will explain some of them in the future steps, uh, and some of them are out of scope for today uh, because uh, it's a course for developers, not operations. But Cassandra is very well uh, protected from these uh, inconsistencies. Hit the head of repairs and read, incremental repairs, and some other mechanisms. Okay, um, Rex, are there any good questions to answer right now before we move on? Uh, any no uh, so Moran uh, Marwan, any node can take and read write request and route these to replica to replica leader, but imagine the request handler and the leader are geographically dispersed. So uh, first of all, forget the word leader. There are no leaders in Cassandra. Cassandra is decentralized, and that is important. As long as you think in this terminology, master server, leader server, um, things like that. Um, SQL uh, mindset, you will try to use Cassandra as MySQL without joins and you will fail because Cassandra is not MySQL without joins. Forget there are no leaders. And if you mean query coordinator, it's not a leader. It's just uh, someone who processes and orchestrates your query processing right now at the moment. For the next query, it will be next server. So, um, and um, Queries first uh, execute. You see, we cannot get too deep into multi data center deployments, but query coordinator works at the data center level. So, uh, and replicas are at the data center level. So, uh, they will be within the same region, within the same uh, availability zone, or multiple availability zones of the same region. And it's totally fine. So, there is nothing to worry about that. Uh, and uh, as I said already, by default, uh, Cassandra uh, driver will reach um, will reach um, uh, one of the replica servers. There is no partition leader again. Each ser it's a decentralized system. There is no leader. A replica. You see, as soon as you think leader, you introduce a single point of failure. Stop it. Um, and then leader is down, next leader has to be re-elected. And that works as soon as you have three servers. But when you have 3,000 servers, it doesn't work. Uh, so, then you may ask a question of how do we get consistent data, and I explain it in the next slides. So that's still very good questions. Okay, then we work uh, with distributed systems. It's very important for us to remember uh, CAP. CAP theorem operates three features. Availability, consistency, and partition tolerance. Uh, availability is the easiest concept of those. Availability basically means uptime. You ask the question, you get the answer. If failure of a single or even multiple servers does not lead to uh, no response, no downtime, your system is highly available. Then, consistency 
means no stale data. You ask for something, you get the most recent, most up-to-date value. If uh, you ask something from a cluster and your uh, cluster returns outdated information, that means your system is cross-node inconsistent. And then finally, partition tolerance, the first concept of CAP, the third concept of CAP, the most misunderstood concept. Partition tolerance means the ability of a system, a distributed system, to survive network partitioning. Please notice, this partitioning has no relation to Cassandra data partitioning. It's uh, just uh, different ideas. What is network partitioning? Network partitioning means what your network of your data center is um, corrupted the way what all servers are running, but some servers cannot reach another server. For example, uh, there on the screen you see a network partitioning where you have six servers running, but four of them, group A, operational, can be conducted by client, but cannot reach group B. And group B, running, operational, can contact each other, can be contacted by customer, but cannot reach group A. Uh, network partitioning is a very, very bad situation. If you don't keep it under control, it may lead to so-called split-brain problem. And split-brain problem, with, uh, like in the relational database world, multiple masters selected. And uh, we have group A with one master, we have group B with another master. Now our database works in network partition state uh, for a couple of days. Uh, or for a couple of hours, some operations are uh, stored in group A, some operations in group B. Data is in totally inconsistent and there is no automated way to handle this problem because of the split brain. We have two, like, two different brains and you will, you will have a lot of fun trying to handle this situation. That is a very bad, it's much worse than uh, downtime, seriously. So, now, what about CEP theorem for distributed systems and why it's so important to understand it? CEP theorem stands for in the distributed environment, in case of failure, in case of emergency, in case of some problems, you can have only two guarantees, uh, only two qualities out of three. I mean, like then, uh, the grass is green, uh, skies are blue, and there are rainbows, and everyone is shiny, then your database is consistent, available, partition tolerant, whatever, everything is great. But then there are some emergencies, problem, lightning strikes, um, and some servers down, you cannot stay in the center, you have to sacrifice something. And under no circumstances you want to sacrifice partition tolerance. Like, you remember this joke, a job can be executed uh, quick or cheap or uh, with a good quality, and you can pick only two. Job can be executed quick and good, but it's not going to be cheap. Or job can be executed uh, quick and cheap, but obviously quality will go is going to suffer. Exactly the same with the CAP theorem. So, for the database, distributed database, we usually speak of CP and AP databases. As we cannot sacrifice partition tolerance under no circumstances, we are going to have OR database on this side, consistent and partition tolerant, OR on this side, available and partition tolerance. And that means what? Uh, for the AP databases, you will always give a, get the answer, but under some circumstances, you may get outdated answer. And for CP databases, you will always get a consistent answer, but you will not always get the answer. Because if some servers are unavailable, CP database will tell you, no man, I'm not answering your question, I don't know what's going on, something is wrong, please recover the situation, and then I will answer all your questions. Strongly consistent databases are CP, eventually consistent databases are AP. Now, there is a very big question People uh, use it to call Cassandra AP, available and partition tolerant, but uh, eventually consistent. I consider this as a mistake. Uh, there are many people right now watching this who will disagree to me, but I insist Cassandra is to be configurably consistent. With Cassandra, we have two levers, two knobs, 
what define our consistency requirements and our situation. And if you launch your data via, for example, um, the replication factor one, you are consistent. I mean, you have one replica, it cannot be inconsistent. And then what's the situation? Right, tunable consistency. Yeah, that's what Artyom says. It's tunable, or I define it like configurable consistency. Tunable consistency. Yeah, that is the correct answer. So, uh, Cassandra is tunably consistent. With uh, replication factor one, I will have always consistent answer. But if anything happens with a server, I will have no answer at all. So, my database is CP. Um, so, how is uh, consistency defined in Cassandra? It's extremely important question. For example, Cassandra is widely used by banks. Uh, but do you want your bank to dispatch an inconsistent information about your bank account state? No, you don't. So, how it's handled in Cassandra? That is a thing you need to understand very well. Two, uh, two things you need to understand. So, replication factor, we discussed it already. And then, so-called consistency level. Also, very often misunderstand conception. Cassandra consistency level defines how many acknowledgements or confirmations you will wait before a response is dispatched by query coordinator. And great thing of that, uh, consistency level can be defined on the per query basis. So, like you see, a replication factor we define for a key space. And in this key space, we will have some tables, and these tables will have some partitions, things like that. With, Cassandra, with a consistency level, it's different. I can set different consistency level uh, for different queries, uh, both in a driver or working in Cassandra query language shell. It's totally configurable. Um, how does topology affect here? Good question. I hope Artyom will answer, but we have to move on. So, there are multiple different Consistency levels. Any for writes one, local one, two, three, quorum, local quorum, and so on. How it works. And what does that mean, consistency level one in this example? Take a look, we have a data center of six servers, and we make a write, so we insert new data with consistency level one. Now, I really seen it many times on Stack Overflow. People think what if you insert data with consistency level one, it means what it will be delivered to only one replica. <sighs> no. Whatever consistency level you use, write will always be delivered to all replicas. Doesn't matter if you go for any, if you go for one, all all uh, data will be delivered to all replicas. But uh, query coordinator, before dispatching confirmation to a client, answer to a client, I got your data, uh, will wait only for one fastest answer. So query client writes to coordinator, client writes to a node, this node uh, becomes a coordinator for this query, dispatches update to all three servers, and waits for the fastest answer, because you are asking three servers to ask, asynchronously, of course, so it's executed in parallel, for sure. The one node would ask, uh, as soon as first node answers, uh, answer is immediately dispatched. With consistency level quorum, you will wait for a majority of answers. So quorum basically means most of the servers. Uh, for example, with replication factor three, most of the servers will be two. With replication factor five, uh, quorum will be three. Most of the servers, like half and a little bit more, uh, should be quite simple. So, with consistency level quorum, we will wait for two confirmations out of three. And we can set consistency level all and wait for all the confirmations. In this case, our data is consistent. But wait, what? There is a little trouble. CP theorem is here and you cannot break it. So, if you write with consistency level all, but CP is still there, what happens when you write with a consistency level all? You basically move your database for this query from AP site 
to CP side. That means you sacrifice availability. So when you write with consistency level O, and if one of the nodes uh, is down, you will not get your data stored because boom, we have this uh, downtime. And that's because you selected consistency level O. Now, very good question. We cannot write with consistency level O, but we still want to get as close to the center of CEP theorem as possible. Like, if there is a magic in IT world, then could we use this magic to try to get to the sweet spot of the center of the CEP? Take a look. Mathematics to the rescue. Science to the rescue. Uh, there is a trick. If we write with a consistency level quorum, so we write to, we know what at least two of out our three servers got the update. And then they read with consistency level quorum, two out of three. We will always ask two uh, servers. Then you always get consistent data. Take a look. If data was written to all of the nodes, we are good automatically. We can ask even one of them and it still will be good. But let's imagine what one of the nodes were down. Uh, query, right query still was executed because Quorum requires two of three and two are available even though the uh, third one is down. And then we ask data. And with Quorum, uh, query coordinator will ask all replicas. And if uh, first two replicas to answer will be uh, updated, then again we get most up-to-date value, so we are consistent. And if one of the replicas to answer first will be one what was not updated, then query coordinator will see what values are matching, or not values exactly, but values hashes are not matching. When what will happen? Client will get a most up-to-date value, most recently updated, and outdated server will get a notification. Hey man, you lost your track. Wake up, please. What's going on? Something changed. And that's called that repair on read. When during the read, we notice it. But something was outdated, stale data, and outdated server will execute a repair on this piece of data, uh, recovering first to the uh, next uh, to most up to date state. And that is the second layer of defense for cross node inconsistency uh, of Cassandra. Good. Uh, so, are there any good questions to discuss? I believe we have to move on. Okay, I see if say quorum or a free if only one node is consistent, we would send the bad data since the other two nodes are not up to date. Uh, no, because it sees uh, what... Um, so, it depends on who will answer first. Uh, if only one node is consistent and two nodes are not consistent, that is a bad situation. It, mean, it means what you wrote with low uh, consistency level. Uh, consistency, uh, consistency is defined by a developer per query. Uh, it's safe to assume what 51% of replicas should be consistent if you write with consistency level of 51%. You see, if you write your data with consistency level 1, then there is only one option to get consistent data. Oh, yeah, that is a good point, by the way. So, Vilas Hedge, thank you for your answer. Let's imagine the situation. We write our data with consistency level 1. It means what we know, what data was received by at least one replica server. But we don't know if it was received by others. And now, we read data with consistency level quorum. Can we be sure what data is not stale? Can we be sure what data is consistent? Please answer in the YouTube chat. Now, all the chat will answer your question. At least their opinion on that. Write one, uh, read quorum. Are we sure what data is consistent? Any more water? It's so hot here today. So come on, people! No, right, Natasha Kumar, totally. If we write one read quorum, we cannot be sure. And now more advanced question: write one, 
which consistency level we need to use to be sure what data is consistent. Right consistency level 1. My question, which consistency level we need to use on read to be sure what data is consistent? And I'm not saying it's the right way, but it will do work. No, not one, not one, not quorum. We just all oh, virage posle. That is the right answer. Maybe I, I see many people saying one. Guys, if I'm writing one and reading one, there are no guarantees at all. You totally can get outdated information. Normally, it's not happening because there are repairs and many other things, but we're speaking about 100% guarantees. Right. If we write consistency level 1, when to get most up-to-date information, 100% always, we need to read with consistency level all. But we just discussed what consistency level all is very dangerous, because then you go to this uh, trap of CEP theorem, and then, and then you may get no answer at all. So our recommendation is write quorum, read quorum for most of the scenarios. There are some cases where you may need some more, um, some different configuration. But those are narrow edge cases and usually you don't run into them. If you handle really billions of operations, if you have strong IoT and factories, and dozens, hundreds of factories across the world, with hundreds of sensors on each of the factory device, dispatching its state every second, like you have huge volume of incoming operations. You can decrease consistency level on right down to any, which is kind of hopefully consistent. Uh, and just because you have so much operations, what you have to decrease your requirements. If any one of a single changes uh, for a single second will be lost, uh, for whatever reason, you still can survive that. But you definitely don't want to have uh, this risk for your bank account. So Cassandra works with different data and you have freedom to set up it in a different way. But to do that, you have to learn how to do it, right? So, we will run quickly through data modeling, very quickly, uh, because uh, for the data modeling it's extremely important. We have dedicated next week, I will be talking about data modeling next week, full session, two hours on the data modeling. Don't miss it. It's very important. But now, very quick introduction. So, cell of a row and a column. Source data must be simple. Uh, then, row. Obviously, a set of cells stored together. Now, you think what's not present in many other databases. Partition. People with SQL experience very often forget about partitions. If you forget about partition, it will strike hard back at you and you don't want it. A misunderstanding partitions is the most common root cause of the problems with Cassandra. Never forget about part partitions because you know what? Partitions love you. They never forget about you. And finally, table. A table is a group of columns and rows storing partitions. Must be quite obvious. Uh, and we are going to a lab to create tables. Hey Rex, what do you think? Sorry, yeah, I put myself on mute. Oh, uh, can you hear? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, uh, okay. I'm switching to your screen. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay, let's go. All right, let's go. So we were at the point where we created the database. I know we have only 15 minutes to go, but. Uh, We'll try to do as much as we can. Um, you know, I think uh, the whole space of uh, um, NoSQL is kind of very interesting because you don't really, and, and I know that I may be stealing a little bit of Alex's thunder here, um, <laughs> you know, you, you don't really start, um, you know, with the data, but you start with the use cases, right? And and that's kind of what you're going to see, um, you know, in the examples that, that are going to be seen here, okay? Um, okay. So again, back to my GitHub link, right? I uh, um, basically created the database, and now I'm at a point of creating the table, which is step five, okay? So I'm gonna create the da uh, table to, to be able to do that. You know, remember I created a, um, you know, a, a database called workshop and with a um, key space called sensor data, right? 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to this, and there are a number of different ways of connecting to this. Um, you know, you can do document API, you can do graph API. Uh, there are a bunch of GraphQL, uh, but but you know today we're going to use uh, SQL. Okay, and uh, pretty straightforward to use it. All that I'm going to do is I'm going to spec, um, you know, uh, uh, go to the SQL console and I'm good to go. So just in case, you know, it's not obvious to you, I'll go back and start again. Okay, and all of this again, in, you know, is outlined in uh, the uh, GitHub link. Um, so if you can go to workshops and just hit connect, right? Uh, workshops is the database that we were talking about, right? And and basically, you can say SQL console here, and that'll bring up the SQL console. Okay, so it knows it's connected to that, and and you can start playing around with it. Okay, so you can describe the key spaces. Um, it you can uh, do describe or you can do uh, you know just DESC right, and um, actually it even has uh, um, command completion. Okay, so if you just do describe key spaces. It'll it'll show you all the different key spaces, including some of the system key spaces and so on. Okay, and some of the key spaces that I have created, right? Uh, so kind of take a look at that, right? And then kind of keep going, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to use this particular key space called sensor data. To be able to use that, we just say use and provide this key space name. So notice the prompt changing, right? You know now you have sensor data. Um, as your key space that you're going to be manipulating with. So now we're going to create a network table. You know, pretty straightforward, right? It has a name, it has a description, it has a region, and your key is name, right? And again, we'll talk about partition key, primary key, uh, and you know, uh, sorting key, you know, um, composite keys, uh, clustering keys, and all that. Uh, in a little bit, but uh, we're going to just go ahead and create this table now. For now, okay. So create the table. So by the way, SQL um, is Cassandra query language. It's kind of similar to SQL, right? Uh, I mean, there are some parallels. I shouldn't say similar, uh, but in in philosophy, it's the same. Basically, you will be able to query your data using this uh, Cassandra query language. So I've created the table. It's always a good you know, practice. If not exists, right? Because if it does exist, you probably don't want to overwrite. You know, you may you will get an error, but you know it's always a good practice to kind of do this. Okay. Now again, let's go and describe our tables, and now we should be able to see, um, you know, this particular table as well, which is uh, networks table, right? So describe the tables, disk tables. Okay, and you'll see here uh, networks, right? Uh, one of the things that we recommend that you don't do is kind of do this, right? Because what this is doing is it's going to every partition and pulling the data from there. Uh, but since we don't have a lot of data, uh, this kind of gives you at least some familiarity with uh, SQL. Okay, don't don't do it. Um, right now there is no data in here, um, so we're probably okay. But uh, imagine if you had like uh, millions of these. Uh, very unlikely you'll have. Millions of networks, uh, but you will definitely have millions of sensor data. So definitely don't want to do that with the sensor data, right? So, so it depends on the use case. Um, but in general, whenever you have a select star, you know, just think about it, right? So let's create a sensors by network. You know how um, you know intuitive, right? You know you you you. Um, Organize your data around your use cases. That's really what it comes down to. And and you know Alex is going to talk a little bit more about this, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this table. I'm I'm just going to copy this part of it. Okay, and I'm going to create it. Okay, and you can see here it's pretty straightforward. You have primary key as the network, and then within that you have a sensor. So essentially it's ordered within a sensor within the same. Uh, um, primary key or partition key. Okay, all right. So now we have done that. Uh, let's go back and um, see why this is bad. Because what we are doing here is we are creating a temperature by sensor without really using the date, and we will correct that in the next um, 
invocation, but let's do this anyway, okay? And you can see here, you know, the clustering order is by timestamp descending. So you can have ascending, descending, and, and you know, all kinds of options. Uh, I mean, those kind of options there. Okay, so, so I'm doing that. Okay, not a good idea to do that. So, because um, again, you know, we probably want to include date within it. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna drop the table and we're gonna create a new temperatures by sensor which will include the date, okay? So we're gonna drop the uh, um, previous table and we're gonna create the table with the correct uh, fields in there, okay? So we're gonna drop the table. And sometimes this takes a little bit of time and you might even get a uh, error. Um, you know, just try it again, you know, if, so as you can see here, you know, you can see the, see an error, but let's not worry about it right now. I'm gonna go back and take a look at it in a second. So this is the temperatures by sensor table, okay? And here, what I'm doing is I'm creating, um, you know, the sensor, the date, and the timestamp, and then order it based on timestamp, rather than here, where, you know, it, the uh, the primary key did not include the date, and you really should have included the date, right? So, so what I'll do is I'll just make sure that my, um, bad table has been deleted, right? You'll see here, if you try it again, you know, it'll it'll basically come back and tell you that, you know, that's not existent, uh, which means that it already got deleted. Okay. So now let's again go ahead and describe the tables, right? You know, just again, all that I'm doing is following along, right? You know, uh, step by step. Describe the tables and you'll see here, I have the temperatures by sensor that I just created Sensors by network, which I created earlier, and then of course the network table. Okay, so again, you know, if you do a select star from, not a good idea, but just to for illustration purposes, by <laughs> network. <laughs> yeah, uh, very important. Working with Cassandra, don't forget what you work with Cassandra, and doing select all from a table means full clusters come. Uh, asking exactly. all of the servers for all their pieces of the same table. In most of the cases, if you are doing select star, it's one huge mistake, and from table without work conditions, it's a second huge mistake. So this uh, statement is an absolute anti-pattern with Cassandra. Exactly right. So again, I'm gonna, having said that, I'm gonna do it anyway, right? <laughs> no, again, uh, the idea is I'm taking a look at the key, right? You can see here, it includes the sensor, the date, and then it's ordered on based on timestamp. Okay, so all of this was based on how I defined the table. Okay, so that's good. I have described tables. Um, now I'm going to start inserting some data, right? And typically, like all operations, what we do is we insert, right? So those are referred to as CRUD operations based on you know the popular uh, REST paradigm, right? You know, which is create read, update, and delete, right? Um, and, and really, I mean, that's exactly what you do with data anyway, right? So create is to insert data, read is to read the data, update is update the data, and D is delete the data. And, and you'll see examples of all of this. Okay, so let me show a few. I probably don't need to go into all of these, right? Because they're all kind of sam uh, just few samples. Let me show some samples at least. So here you can see I inserted into networks, okay, and and just to make sure that I am gonna select star for networks, you know, just make sure that I inserted it correctly. Okay, and you can see here this is exactly what we inserted just a moment ago, right? We have forest net, we have volcano net. And they are based on forest fire detection network, volcano monitoring network, and what are the regions it's in there, right? Okay, so so we have that. Uh, keep going, right? We inserted that. We can insert. All that I do is again cut and paste it, and I'm good to go, right? Okay, so just keep following along with the steps. I insert a whole bunch of things in temperatures by sensor, 
you know, all of this is done manually. I mean, you can easily imagine this being done programmatically, right? You know, we have an IoT device, you know, which is pumping these devices, I mean, these uh, uh, data uh, and into the uh, database either directly or maybe, you know, like we have uh, a streaming, um, you know, software called Pulsar. So where Pulsar is listening to the sensors and depending on which region or which network, it will automatically, uh, you know, put it into the appropriate database, you know, depending on, you know, the location and so on, right? So, so did I insert this or did I not? Let me do it again anyway. Okay, so, so just follow along with that. Okay, and um, keep going with that. Okay, and, and there are some questions every now and then. Uh, don't do the select star, but it's okay to do that. Uh, probably what you want to do is something like this, because this is not like what Alex said, you know, it's not a full cluster scan. This is specifically going to the forest net network mm -hmm. and looking for that, right? Yeah, so, so, so let's take a look at this particular data, right? And you can see here, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, data associated with that as well. Um, or, you know, something like this as well. Okay, and you can kind of play around with that. Okay. So I think that's a reasonable um, representation. Is there anything that we need to talk about? Because I know that we are kind of approaching the end of the workshop, right? Um, so you can get a partition and delete at the row level and then read again. So row level delete, there is partition level delete. Uh, all of this are you know, enunciated in the instructions, okay? Um, so try these, try a combination of these uh, and, 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 and see how it goes and, and kind of play around with it, you know, so that if you never use SQL, um, you know, definitely, uh, getting more comfortable with this will will definitely help you a lot. Okay. Um, anything else I need to stress? Uh, no, I uh, think we are good. Uh, anyway, we will have to do it all on their own as a part of a homework. Correct. So I think yeah. we are good to go. Okay. Right. So uh, let me switch back to my screen and okay. I'll drink that in a moment. Uh, first of all, there is a question I wanted to answer. Very, very, very important question. Uh, let me go over. So, <laughs> good and painful question. Um, where is it? Uh, so somebody uh, said that. Uh, Herman, echo is written. One, two, three. No, it shouldn't be. Do I have echo? No, 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 no. No, oh, okay. So okay, okay. stop okay. scaring me, guys. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, good. Okay. Uh, so uh, I wanted to answer a question uh, before. Uh, why Cassandra having better write than read? Uh, that is a good question by Herman Joshi, and that is a common, not really misunderstanding, but misuse of Cassandra. Now, take a look. Cassandra writes are very simple, very fast, and there is nothing uh, what you can do wrong. Uh, with a simple insert, there is nothing what you can do wrong. It can be SQL, uh, malformat, or something like that, uh, typo, then it will not work at all. But if it's a correct SQL and your servers are running, you will get your data stored uh, nearly instantaneously. Because of append only, commit log, all the things like Cassandra is very advanced and very well optimized for writes. But the statement Cassandra writes are better than Cassandra reads is totally wrong. Cassandra reads are as fast as Cassandra writes, except of one real problem. With Cassandra writes, uh, someone writing data cannot do anything wrong. Uh, 
Okay, you can use local patches. Uh, those are not really fast. Um, in the case when you don't need longer patches, but that's a special case, right? But in the normal general, right, generic, right, you cannot uh, do anything wrong. But with reads, you can. With reads, there are so many people misusing Cassandra, just running to use it without reading documentation, watching our videos. You are not like that. You are best of the best. You are watching us right now. But there are so many people doing it wrong. So, as a result, they do just stupid bullshit trying to use Cassandra as MySQL without joints. Cassandra is not MySQL without joints. Then they fail and they say Cassandra reads are slow. <coughs> of course, Cassandra reads will be slow if you are using a low filtering, if you are doing um, full tables, a full cluster scan, full table scan, all things like that, the reads will be slow. But that's not because they are slow, because you are doing something wrong. If your partitions of the size of a terabyte, then scanning this partition will be slow. Is Cassandra wrong on that? No, you did with your data model then wrong. So Cassandra writes are very fast. Cassandra reads are very fast. What's wrong? Is people using it in the wrong way? They say, I love you, you are not like that, you are learning. So now we have to run through some points. Uh, and we are short on time, so we will discuss it very briefly. And for uh, and for most of that, we will go a deep, do a deeper dive uh, next week. So this one is the sneak peek on the next week content. Uh, Alex, Alex, yeah, Alex, Peter, uh, Peter had a point on um, there's this thing that your voice is hard and I. I until now, it was fine for me, but now your voice is very odd. You know, it's like I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> it it sounds very very different. Like uh, no idea what it how how to put it. One two three. I don't know, guys. If there is no echo, then no, let's survive. It's, my... it's fine now. It's fine now. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good. So. Uh, so we will do a quick run of some parts of the next week, but please take it seriously. Uh, right now you cannot go to your uh, uh, boss and say, I learned Cassandra. Hell no! Uh, you are only starting to learn Cassandra, and one of the most important sessions will be next week. But now a quick uh, run through for some parts of that. Designing data model with Cassandra is essential. Data model done wrong is the easiest way to fail with Cassandra. If you are not failing to fail, you better learn data model. We design it this way. First, we analyze customer behavior or how the application is going to be used in the future. If you have heard of user stories, very much the same. We identify workflows, dependencies of those workflows, to be explained later, and needs. Based on these workflows, we define queries what will answer to those workflows, customer workflows. And knowing the queries, we design tables using denormalization to be explained next week. So, uh, in the data modeling methodology created by our uh, very own dear uh, Artem Chabatko PhD, right uh, in the chat. Uh, there is a data modeling methodology. First two steps have to be executed before we proceed is we have to understand our data and we do it designing a conceptual data model and describe it with entity relationship diagram. And then also we have to identify access patterns with application workflow model. We do it with application workflow. We describe it with application workflow diagram. Uh, oh, thank you, Natasha, and thank you for great questions and points in the chat. Uh, sorry you have to quit. Please, next week, uh, let's try to stay for longer together because there is many quiz. Okay, then mapping together conceptual data model we identified uh, while understanding our data. And access, uh, and, uh, access patterns, and describe it in our application workflow diagram, we apply query first approach and we basically write the queries to define the later logical data model. Then putting some Cassandra optimizations on this logical data model, we 
optimize and implement uh, that as a consequence of physical data model, which we already then uh, use to create uh, Cassandra query language statements, what will uh, create then uh, SQL statements to create the tables. Um, so, entity relationship diagram you could have seen before with a relational database world because it's basically more or less the same what you use there to, un to understand your data. In this case, working for sensors storing temperatures and sensors grouped and network, we will have networks with name, description, region, and number of sensors. Each network has some sensors with ID, latitude, longitude, of location, and some characteristics. And each sensor records temperature with a timestamp and a value. That has to be quite a simple ERD, usually without <laughs> some much bigger, right? And application workflow is easy to understand uh, because, well, each uh, use case has a workflow on your application. In this case, for example, I want to see all raw temperature for a sensor number 15, uh, 16, whatever, for, for a sensor. Uh, this query, uh, call it Q4, show raw temperature values for a sensor. Now there is a question. Can I execute this query in a, just out of the blue, having no, uh, knowing nothing about the sensor, knowing nothing about the networks? Answer is no, I cannot. To show raw temperature values for a sensor, I need to know ID of the sensor. And here comes the idea of a workflow dependency. In order to execute uh, show raw temperature values for a sensor, I need to know sensor ID. That means what Q4 statement is not standalone. It depends on something. On what it depends? On the previous Q3, which is display on several sensors in a network. And then finally, Q3 displays on sensor in a network. Can I execute it standalone out of the nothing, in the middle of nothing, in the middle of desert? No. To show all sensors of a network, I need to know name of a network or ID of this network. And that means what my workflow has one more dependency. First, I have to show to customer all sensors, uh, all networks, uh, so he or she can click on this network, and then I can display all sensors of this network. And here we go in uh, downwards, we make a totally perfect sense as a customer, as a scientist working with sensor networks on the temperature all across the globe, I log into a system, which step is omitted for clarity, and then I push the button show all sensor networks, I get all the sensors networks, because this one has no dependencies, I just want to see all of them. Then, choosing the sensor, uh, choosing the network, I will see all the uh, sensors in this network, because I already know the ID. I clicked on this network, and then having all the sensors in the network, I can click on the sensor and show all raw temperature values for this sensor, and this uh, query can be executed because I know the ID. You see, workflow, like entities, has some relations. But for all workflows, have dependencies too. That's very important to understand. Okay. And then mapping it all together, entities to their workflows are going to access them. I see which query will be answered, uh, which workflow step will be answered by which table. We are starting to think already about tables. And we can see what networks may be name, description, region, and sensors. Sensors by networks will be network sensor coordinates. Temperatures by sensor will be sensor, date, timestamp, and value. Very simple. And K here means partition key. And C means clustering column. We will explain it next week. And I'm skipping Q2 because it's more advanced case. We will again analyze next week. And now, optimizing it and bringing some optimizations finally, we are doing it very simple. Latitude and longitude of sensors will be just decimals. Uh, sensor ID will be just the text I'm fine with it. Network ID will be just text I'm also fine with it. Characteristics will be a map of text text because characteristics can be different from sensor to sensor. Because I'm going to have billions of sensors, they will be from different uh, producers, 
And therefore, when I have different characteristics, so I will use Cassandra type text, uh, kind of, uh, type map uh, for text text, and I'm fine. Temperature by sensor. Uh, this uh, bucketing we will explain next week by sensor and date, and then timestamp and value flow, and so on. And with network, there is a very important and interesting optimization. I cannot get all the networks at once, or it will be a full cluster scan, right? Um, if I do just select all from networks without specifying the partition key, it's totally wrong. But if I just go in to get all networks, then how do I get rid of them? I'm going to manually spammer. Remove. Okay. Uh, good. And uh, thank you. So. And that is a question. I'm going to get some networks. How do I get them if I don't know, uh, if I want to get all of them? The idea is in this case, one of the optimization techniques we will use, we create buckets of a very simple thing. As we are going to have a really limited amount of networks, maybe a couple of hundreds, I will create uh, just bucket type text for them and name it default or name it all, and all of my networks will be in the same bucket. As long as I have limited amount of uh, networks, 100, 1000, 2000, it's not a big deal, partition will still be small, and I'm totally good, yes, it will be a table of a single partition, it's totally fine. If in the future, uh, some of my approach will change, and I will need to store millions of networks, then, okay, I already have buckets. So I will just distribute them over those buckets, and I will be good of that. So as simple as that. So you see how we went from uh, entity relationship diagram describing entities and application workflows describing workshops, uh, workflows, mapping them together, entities and workflows with uh, queries, uh, defining um, logical data models and physical data models with Chibatko diagram. And we are getting our query in the end, because when you have this one, then you have query running. Very simple. And uh, lab 3 will be your homework, part of your homework. And what's next? First of all, some of you definitely deserve some prizes. Well, all of you deserve some prizes, but I see there are many dozens of people think, who are still watching us. And we cannot dispatch dozens of prizes. We are, our budget is limited. But some of you will get the prizes. So, what we do right now, we go to main team. And we will ask you questions. And if you answer questions fast enough, Hey! Nitesh is back, right on time. Quiz is started in a minute, so that's perfect. Now, please do not answer in the YouTube chat. Answer in main team. If you answer on YouTube, it's all great, but you won't get your prize. So jump in on Menti, it's anonymous. You don't have to put your mobile phone or email or credit card number. You just have to enter the code 8290-8577 and you are good. I see 36 people just joined us and we cannot wait. So we launch the quiz in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All systems ready, here we go. Please, during the quiz, watch on your mobile phone or whatever tab you have to open the quiz, because YouTube has a little delay, and on YouTube you will see questions a little bit later, answer slower, and the faster you answer, more chances you have to win, if your answer is right. So let's start. Question number one. Answer fast to get more points. How many master nodes does Cassandra cluster need? At least three per cluster, three per data center, enough to maintain consistency, not a single one. Cassandra is decentralized. How many master nodes does Cassandra cluster need? Make a mistake and I will be fired. <laughs> so I did my, my, my job wrong. Okay, most of you save at my job place. Not a single one. Cassandra is decentralized. And there are 
10 people who still answer it uh, wrong. So, Cassandra does not need master nodes because there is no definition of master node in Cassandra. It's a decentralized. Please stop with my SQL thinking. Let's look at the leaderboard. Yeah, let's take it a little more. And if you go with this my simple thinking to Cassandra, you will fail. And then don't blame me. I tell you, Cassandra is decentralized. So, Bill is the fastest with 957 points. And let's see how it goes with question number two. Answer fast to get more points. How data is being distributed? All data is placed at, uh, to each server. By partitions, range of partitions per node, with address locators using post mail. Okay, and chat is quiet, everyone is answering so busy with Menti. I wish you all the best, I wish you to win some swag from data stacks. Right! Data is being distributed by partitions, range of partitions per node. and. Guys who answer it, all data is replicated to each server. Apple handles with Cassandra hundreds of petabytes. Can you imagine a server? You can squeeze it into a single server. There is no such machine in the world what can be uh, what is able to dispatch this data within milliseconds. No, no, no. By partitions, data is distributed. It's a distributed and decentralized database. And who was fastest this time? I believe it was Pravin Tuma bringing to a fourth place, and Kevin is on the first. Let's move. Question number three. Answer fast to get more points. Which replication factor is recommended? Uh, replication 1.5, uh, replication 3, replication 15, replication 42. Can you, can you have a factor and have a decimal? Um, you know, is that right? Uh, I mean, it's like half bit. I can do it all day. <laughs> all right. Right, replication factor recommended is free. You definitely cannot have 1.5. <laughs> uh, so it was simple, but who was fastest? And the fastest was like, that's pretty even. Mr. Wonka was fastest, but it didn't help him to get in the top three, and top three are getting prizes. Sumit Kumar, Kevin P, and Praveen Tuma. Well done. Well, so all within four. ten points, so, you know, it's anybody's game now. Yeah, 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 it's nothing is decided. Yeah. So, answer fast to get more points. What is AstroDB? Oh, that's an easy one. Uh, it's, it's a constellation. A with stars. <laughs> right, right. It's a local in memory uh, version of Cassandra. Uh, it's Cassandra as a service in the cloud. Uh, it's a development. It's kind of a tricky question. Uh, I don't want to give any hints because I, before time is over. Astros definitely can be used as a development tool. But the correct answer, AstroDB is Cassandra as a service in the cloud. So everyone made it right. Well done. Everyone made it. But who was the fastest? Okay, a lot of points, but the fastest was Ravi Kumar jumping on the sixth place. And Sumit Kumar, Praveen Tuma, and Kevin P are in top three. And that's question number five. So, answer fast to get more points. What is a primary key? Same as partition key. Does not apply to NoSQL databases. Uniquely identifies a row. It's a colon in the partition key. It's the main house key. So keys are a very important topic, and we will discuss them in more details next week. But maybe you got that from the first week. All right, primary key uniquely identifies a row. That's so well done job, by the way. Uh, so uh, then it's not same as a partition key because primary key has partition key and uh, optionally clustering columns. Primary key present at NoSQL database, and it's not a column in the partition key. So, 
Maar goed, uh, Gangra, uh, Gangra was not so fast this time, but still on top 10. As Yu was fastest, jumping to the top 3. And Pravin Tuma made it on the very first place. Crown looks very good for the first place. Uh, Someone Avatar. So that is a great job. And that's question number 6. So answer fast to get more points. Uh, what is a partition key? A consecutive number applied to each new record. A designated field in your table to partition your data. An optional table field for optional partitioning. A key to partitioning this reality from the next. What is the partition key? If the time is up, most of you made it right. It's a designated field to your table to partition the data. It's not a consecutive number and it's not optional. It is required without partition key because somebody will not know where to place your data. Praveen made it made the right answer, but a little bit slow. The rush was the fastest, and Praveen goes to the fifth place out of top three. From the first place to the fifth place. Oh, that's so sad, but game goes on. As you, Sumit Kumar, and Ravi Kumar, are you guys brothers or brother and sister or what? Or just. It's a common uh, last name in India, right? But anyway, let's move on. Question 7 of 8. Answer fast to get more points. Executing select query without the partition key is recommended way to retrieve data, uh, right way if data was inserted without a partition key, a way to full cluster scan, illegal and punishable by law. You know what? On my free time, I work in NoSQL police. And I totally believe what has to be illegal and punishable by law. Sadly, it isn't, so the last option is wrong. But which of first three is right? Right! Most of you made it again. So, select query without a partition key is a way to full cluster scan. It's a not recommended way to retrieve data. That is for sure. Uh, if you will do it as a part of NoSQL police, I will come and arrest you. And then, uh, right way, uh, if data was inserted without a partition key, you cannot insert data without a partition key, because without a partition key, Cassandra will not know to which node place your data. Simple as that. Partition key value cannot be known. None of the leaders made a mistake. My congratulations. And Praveen was very fast, Viraj was fastest, so Viraj jumps to the first place. Sumit Kumar and Ravi Kumar keeping the second and third with SU and Praveen and Tuma on the fourth and fifth accordingly. And that is the last question. So, breathe in, breathe out, warm up your fingers, and get ready, I'm launching the last question of the series, of the first workshop of our series. You know what to do. Answer fast. In the data modeling framework, we start modeling with a conceptual data model and application workflow, with a physical data model, with a logical data model, with copy-paste from Stack Overflow. You know, uh, very often I start the development of something with copy-paste from Stack Overflow, but will you help you with a data modeling I am not totally sure. You better attend our courses. And the right answer is conceptual data model and application workflow. Logical data model is the next step. You will need logical data model, but the right answer is conceptual data model and application workflow. I see most of you made it. But who was the fastest? Are you nervous? Do you want to see the results? Okay, I will not, tor I will not torture you for too long. <laughs> Let's see who was the fastest. And looks like Praveen Tuma was very fast this time. Yeah, Praveen Tuma is fastest. Jumping on the fourth place, that's not enough. Oh, Just no. a couple of points. So I'm mean, sorry. Come again next week. Yeah. And we do congratulate you, Rush, with a well deserved first place. Maybe uh, two of the fastest answers, I believe, but very consistent result. That is great. Viraj, oh, that's Viraj Pasle. That's congrats. That's uh, and very good questions, by the way. Yes. And very good results at the quiz.
Then B capitulate Ravi Kumar and Samit Kumar with a second and third place. You are getting the prizes from the data stocks. Uh, don't quit and make a screenshot of your winning position. You will have to send it, so make a screenshot of your uh, your first place, second place, third place, you will read it. Then for rules on the leaderboard, but not in the top three. Praveen Tuma, SU, Gaurav, Losef Marwan, Amit Petesh. You did really great. You are on the leaderboard of the many dozens of people competing. It's still a great result. And better luck, next week, come again. For those who are not on the leaderboard. Young know, guys, our prize are quite uh, interesting, but that's not a uh, Mercedes or Villas or Mediterranean, nothing like that, sorry. Uh, so, the best prize you get, you got today, is your knowledge. With the knowledge, attending workshops like this one, attending next hour workshops, you will get better and better at what you're doing. Get a better job, get a better, getting better salary. So, you already uh, getting prizes and already got your prize. But still, better luck and better luck next week. I want you to have data stocks t-shirt, that's for sure. I don't remember what we currently dispatch as a prize, Rex, maybe you remember? I don't, uh, but uh, you know it, it's going to be cool. But but like you said, it's really being part of the workshop. You know, um, mm -hmm. being able to participate in the chat and up leveling everybody's knowledge. I think that's the most rewarding part of the workshop. I guess. Yes. Yes. Uh, now I will keep this window open so you can answer even after the workshop. Uh, what did you like the most? What should we improve? I'm sorry for echo. It's found it already and fixed, uh, so it will not happen uh, next workshop. I'm very sorry. New setup, new laptop, new software. So you can keep answering. So what, what should we improve is voice. Uh, what does that yeah. mean? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. So we are getting next steps. Homework. Homework is very important because that's the you apply your knowledge, you learn it, and get better in that. Really, homework is extremely important. And you got a Cassandra workshop made for it. So, uh, how to submit your homework? Uh, Sumit Kumar, you are good. Uh, still, um, you please contact. Um, can I use a uh, screenshot from YouTube? Will not help, but uh, still contact. Uh, do we have a slide for to home contact? Give me a moment. Oh, okay. So how do uh, retrieve your uh, page? Uh, uh, sorry, how to retrieve your price? Please contact me. <coughs> mm -hmm. I'm sending my personal link right now. Please, everyone, uh, catch me on uh, following this link. And uh, if you made it to the top three, contact me there and uh, send me uh, your screenshots. Samit Kumar, just contact me, I remember your name. And if you would like to contact with Rex, I prepared a short link for him as well. Perfect, thank so, you. Let me. Oops, typo. <laughs> uh, right. So please contact us. Uh, we are DataStax developers uh, and we are happy. Uh, to work with you and help you in your Cassandra questions or ask your questions, whatever. Uh, so, first three places, please catch me, it's necessary. Uh, following the link I pasted in the chat and uh, just contact me also if you want to add us on LinkedIn. Uh, Rita, thank you for such a nice feedback. Uh, now, homework. Uh, don't forget to do the homework to get your page. Homework link is right here. It's, uh, it, should, it will be pasted by a Nightbot in a moment. Homework. Yeah, that is a link to homework. Thank you, Nightbot. Uh, join our Discord community. It's like getting close, it's around 20,000 people talking about Cassandra and different things, whatever IT things. So there are, we are present there and many other developers uh, beginners, experts, everyone is there. So it's very nice Discord server. And that was uh, Rex and Alex uh, from DataStacks. I mean, one one thing I wanted to mention was, uh, yes, yes. you know, I think this is a great opportunity because these three sessions back to back to back, right? 
Uh, it doesn't happen very often. So, so if somebody, any of your friends have missed the first uh, session, it doesn't matter. Ask them to attend the second and third. They can always catch up with the first. But, but this kind of gives you a a, a complete 360 degree view of development with NoSQL uh, because you start, you know, with intro to NoSQL. You do a lot of data modeling. And then in the final one, you're going to do some programming. So, so I think it's a great opportunity. You know, tell your family and friends, you know, to attend, and maybe they'll win some swag too. You know, so. Yeah. Right. So someone asked how to subscribe to our upcoming workshops. That is a link to our upcoming workshops. And now a very important thing: if you have some, for, yes, uh, Rex, and thank you so much for saying that. I totally forgot, uh, but that's wrong. It's never late to catch up. Uh, you cannot participate in today's menti because menti is over, quiz is over, but you still can share with your friends where you can watch the recording and uh, as you like that, then please recommend it to them. Don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube, send this link uh, to others and then they can join you next week live already and they still can get page, they watch a recording they do a homework, they get the wage. That's it. If in which day the homework has to be submitted. Good question, Avishak. So, we don't have uh, any strict deadline, but we kindly ask you to uh, fill the homework uh, within one week, so we can review them. That is a manual review process, because we want to see what you are thinking, how you are doing that, and as a result, uh, you have to uh, we, we will review it in the end of the week, so please don't ask for a grade uh, tomorrow, it will take some time. Uh, what is the criteria to get vouchers? So, for this workshop series, what's the criteria to get vouchers? If you get, if you make all your homeworks, you will totally get it. Uh, so, if you uh, make your homework and it passes, you will be good. And homework... It's a beginner level workshop, okay? So it's not going to be like protecting, defending your PhD, uh, nothing like that. It's going to be just follow the instructions, learn, uh, pay attention, and you will be good. Yeah. Um, and uh, assume it, Kumar, you don't need screenshot, just contact me on LinkedIn with a link I sent you earlier. HTTPS, dtsx.io slash Alex. Yep. So please, everyone, catch me on LinkedIn. I will be happy to have you there. Then, I think we are done. Rex, anything to add? No, I think that's great. Uh, again, you know, two more sessions to go. Uh, please come back and, uh, you know, thanks for everybody. Uh, I think we took a little bit longer than we anticipated, but but uh, we covered a lot of ground. So thanks for the wonderful questions. You know, I learned a lot, so, so it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming, and see you next week. Bye. Bye.